Hello and welcome to the program. I am Ama Marcus. The eagerly anticipated appointment to the Cabinet of South Africa for positions for the seventh administration of the government has elicited a range of responses. Now, this comes following President Ramaphosa's inauguration last month and the nation's national and provincial elections on the 29th of May. It's anticipated the government of national unity would stabilize the market, boost nation's economic growth for the next five years, and generate a significant number of much-needed jobs. Mbule Nzege Leonard, who is a senior consultant at Concerto, a public affairs management company, joins us this morning from Cape Town, South Africa. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Leonard. Good morning and thank you for having me on air. Or good afternoon, should I say, in okay. Spanish. <laughs> thank you for joining me. Well, with these ministerial appointments, were there any surprises you know, from the ministers? We see that some ministers were reappointed to their normal ministries. Others were taken to new ministries. Were there any surprises or this was totally expected? Well, it was a 78-member executive with uh, 32 individuals being uh, appointed to full cabinet portfolios. It's uh, unprecedented in South Africa, even though we are used to having um, very large cabinets. Nevertheless, there were some um, expectations uh, with respect to how many um, positions that the opposition would get. Uh, we already knew that the Democratic Alliance would get six positions in cabinet, and then the other four, because 10 positions were given to opposition members as full-fledged ministers, um, were given to um, other members of the um, government national unity now this was a very this was a highly political cabinet and what we saw was that many of ramaphosa's president ramaphosa's allies were retained in cabinet and shifted to different positions so for example the surprise is that um angie mocheka who had been the basic education minister throughout ramaphosa's first term as well as during the presidency of president zuma she was sent to defense even though she hasn't had any prior defense um experience um, other cabinet stalwarts, such as Gwede Mantashe, the um, chairman of the ANC, was retained in mineral resources. Um, you also had individuals like Senjo Tunu, who had been a um, minister in the previous cabinet, who was promoted to police ministry. So you have a lot of recognizable fi figures, Stellan Dabini, Abrahams, and others, who have made return to cabinet. But nevertheless, you also have a host of new players not only from the opposition, but also from within the ANC um, who are coming into this cabinet as well. Okay, so how do you envision these parties will be able to work together? As you see that two or more parties are in one ministry, for example, the finance ministry, you see two people from the DA and from the ANC. So how do you think these two parties will work together with their different goals and you know, objectives? Well, just to reiterate, there are 11 parties in the government of national unity, right? And they have a basic minimum program to highlight that there are certain guidelines that they will adhere to. Nevertheless, even though there are 11 parties, the ANC has managed to maintain strict control of the strategic ministry. So the economic cluster, as you cited, finance ministry, they are still fully in control. Trade and investment, they're still in control. Security cluster. Now, pertaining to finance, for example, you have the returning Enid Gonandwana, who is still in charge. And then his deputy, David Masundo, is also returning as deputy finance minister. So there's going to be a significant amount of continuity with respect to, you know, the ANCs or the government's um, prevailing program, which is uh, fiscal, cons fiscal consolidation, as well as ensuring that there's the implementation of the National Development Plan, which is the um, growth and economic framework um, that South Africa has adopted. Um, for example, with respect to the DA being in the deputy finance position, they'll have an oversight um, mission, but then they're going to be aligned with what the government action is. Because at the end of the day, even though they are representing different parties, it is taken, the decisions are taken as a cabinet, and they're going to have to align with that. But then nevertheless, there is possibility that there will be disagreements along the way, um, especially, I think, between the DA and the ANC, which have been... Um, not been aligned along policy lines for most of, um, you know, their time as the forefront parties in South African politics. Okay, so one of the notable changes we saw in Mr. Ramaphosa's cabinet was the appointment of Baba Krise. Well, she was the former Minister of Forest Fisheries and Environmental uh, Privatization. Now, this... Uh, 
comes as a pivotal change as she moves over to the transport ministry with her deputy who is from the IFP. Well, uh, with her deputy, right? Yeah, who is from the IFP. Well, Transnet comes into focus because, of course, she is now heading the transport ministry. Now, how important is this portfolio when it comes to the whole general South African economy? Yes, Barbara Creasy um, was one of the stalwarts, one of the uh, es escapees from the previous administration to this one. She's very well regarded. Um, she did very well to uphold the environmental agenda while she was in her previous position. And her deputy, um, Kululeko Klengwa, he's also a very renowned parliamentarian. Um, he's 38 years old, but he has been in parliament since 2012 and was even in charge of the public accounts um, uh, parliamentary commission at the National Assembly. So you have two individuals who have a very good track record. And this is going to be very important with respect to the transport ministry, which is one of the backbones of the South African economy. You speak about transit. For those who don't know, this is essentially the state logistics um, firm. And what it has in its portfolio is to control the ports as well as the railways. Um, the South African port system, despite the fact South Africa is the largest economy in Africa, um, it has been, it has not been as competitive. The transit has been beleaguered by corruption. And as a result, South Africa's port system is not generating the level of investment as well as the economic growth that it should, it's supposed to. Likewise, with the railways. And as a result, railway um, activity, which was one of the three levers of the South African economy alongside mining and agriculture, has significantly reduced. And this has put a strain on road transport. And we've seen a significant number of accidents as well as um, a deterioration in the road infrastructure. Um, so she's going to have a contributing role in, you know, realigning the entities such as transit, as well as the ports um, into the national economic framework. But then I must note that transit is a state owned enterprise and the state owned enterprises, the public enterprises ministry is now under the control of the president. So now she will only have a complementary role with respect to, you know, how transit will continue to be restructured. The, my, the, ma, the majority of activity will emanate now from the presidency in that regard. Mm. Well, it would definitely be interesting to see the ministers settling into their new offices and taking up responsibilities. But let's focus on the financial side of things. Well, the finance ministry, no changes was made for the minister. However, we have the introduction of a second deputy minister who is Asho Chopin and who is from the DA. Now, that makes it two deputy finance ministers. So what role would they be playing? And I understand this is a new development in the finance ministry. Why is this important to have two deputy finance ministers and what separate roles will they be playing? As I highlighted earlier, um, this is a government of national unity and the ANC had to make a significant amount of compromises um, in order to accommodate all the parties. The Democratic Alliance, the largest party in the, um, in the uh, coalition, had asked for control of um, various economic cluster ministries. They weren't given that, but then nevertheless, the ANC had to make concessions and ensure that at least they have a role with respect to oversight and decision making. So I think that's going to be the case with respect to what you have with the finance ministry. But nevertheless, the principal, um, the Honorable Gonandwagwa, is going to continue. There's going to be policy continuity, fiscal consolidation, so that South Africa should continue to reduce its budget deficit. So we should be able to streamline expenditure. Um, nevertheless, South Africa has experienced very sluggish growth over the last decade, 0.8%. And there, in addition to that, even though it's going to be a fiscal consolidation agenda, I think that is also important in order to address poverty, inequality, and to stimulate economic growth that they should be able to pursue some sort of pro-growth agenda as well. And that will require that, you know, um, an expansionist fiscal policy is pursued. So um, maybe the DA representative will be in that regard um, aligned with pursuing the pro-growth agenda, considering that they are a liberal party. And then now you have uh, David Masundo, who has also been in that position as deputy finance minister, and Golanduaga continuing now with, you know, trying to streamline um, a lot of the um, uh, unnecessary expenditure that has been um, occurring in the past. Okay, so let's move over. We've seen the formation of the electricity and the energy departments into one. While the former finance minister of electricity is heading this with Samantha Graham from the DA. Now the question here, to privatize or not? Now we're looking at the energy sector, which we've had cases of rolling blackouts in South Africa. So what do you think, to privatize the sector or not? 
personally, um, I don't think that privatization is the way to go forward. So uh, for those who aren't aware, the um, state-owned um, electricity provider, ESCOM, it has the monopoly with respect to power production, transportation, and distribution in South Africa. It provides the majority of edu um, 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 electricity to the country. And for the past 15 years, we've been experiencing what we call here load shedding, which is rolling blackouts. And that scenario has significantly increased over the past two years. Um, last year, we had two, over 200 days of load shedding. Um, in 2022, it was over 100 days. Um, interestingly enough, today marks 100 days that we haven't had scheduled blackouts and this is due in large part to the institution of the, the that is the creation of this electricity ministry last year um the merging with the energy um department which was under the mineral resources ministry pre previously does is that it streamlines the ability to implement legislation and to carry out initiatives which, which will help to improve renewable energy and other um, alternative forms of energy production because um ESCOM is being restructured at this point in time. Uh, what is happening is that the current leaders are saying that the coal-fired plants, because coal is the main source of electricity production in South Africa, should not be decommissioned as quickly as, it as they had initially said it should be. And this is one of the reasons why we're having significant load shedding besides the corruption and mismanagement that's happening at, 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 at ESCOM. But now, with this electricity and energy ministry, they have a greater ability to not only reform and restructure um, ESCOM, because as you know, South Africa is a very unequal country. If you put in place privatization, it's going to create a scenario where whoever takes um, um, control of the body is going to look towards air providing electricity to more um, affluent areas, and then the population, the majority, won't have access to it. So the reform and restructure of ESCOM under public authorities, in my opinion, should continue. But then now, with the alignment of the energy um, component to that ministry, there's going to be now the ability for them to put in place um, legislation to promote renewable energy as well as other alternative forms of energy production, which the private sector is already getting involved with and can continue to be a part of going forward. Okay, Mr. Nsega, you did mention earlier that this is a government of national collision. Okay, so people from different parties, you mentioned 11 parties, are coming together to form these governments and ministries. And of course, there are going to be challenges. So I have to ask, what are the challenges that arose when they're trying to put all of this together? <coughs> and how is the government looking to address it? Yes, I mean, up until a few days ago, they were you know, fears that the Democratic Alliance would pull up because they had initially been promised a certain number of ministries and then the ANC backtracked and then, you know, letters are being leaked here and there to the media. The president also sent a very terse worded letter um, criticizing the DA for how they were pursuing. And, you know, the other parties, you know, were just standing back and just watching as well. So, you know, you have to understand that all of these parties have their ideological as well as historical trajectories which differentiate themselves very, very significantly. The, a the ruling ANC is the party which spearheaded the end of apartheid. The Democratic Alliance has a significantly white, has majority white voter base. These are the beneficiaries of apartheid. And, you know, they've been seen as a party which tries to defend the privileges that um, continue to exist um, despite the end of apartheid. You also have the IFP, the Inkata Freedom Party, which is a socially conservative uh, party. So, you know, you have a disparate range of ideologies, goals, and objectives. And you've already, last night, there was an interview on the state broadcaster where uh, Helen Ziller, the DA executive, uh, federal chair, she's effectively the head of the party, was saying that, you know, the DA cabinet ministers are going to be implementing DA rather than government policy, which isn't supposed to be the case. So there is very high room for disagreement. But nevertheless, um, the GNU statement of intent underscores that dialogue is going to be the owner order of the day. If there are disagreements, there is going to be, there are political councils which are going to be um, established. There are going to be discussion forums. There is going to be a national political dialogue in order for all the members of the GNU and even, you know, civil society and business leaders to discuss about the, you know, future of the country because South Africa has entered a new political dispensation. This is the most important political development since the 1994 elections, which ended over 300 years of white political domina um, domination. So there are going to be disagreements, but I think considering how the negotiations, how the election results were 
um, accepted by the ANC, how the opposition was able to come to a compromise. Because, I mean, if you look at Europe, it takes several months at times for many of the countries in coalitions to be able to establish a government. It took South Africa about a month to do that, just under a month. And this is despite the fact that you have parties which are completely at lo loggerheads with each other, which have very different ideologies. So I think that they're going to be mature enough to be able to resolve the differences. But that being said, there will be disagreements along the way. All right. Now, let's look at the e the impact of this collision governments that will have on the economic policies. You did mention that it looks like one of the parties in the offices that now putting place in place DA strategies instead of the government strategies. Now, what you know will this collision governments what effects will it have on South Africa's economic policies as well as its international relations to other countries? And of course, not forgetting that uh, South Africa is still instituting the case against Israel at the International Criminal Court of Justice. So, are we looking at a change of the international stance or a change in international policies as well as economic policies moving forward? Let me start in the foreign policy. Um, we had now one, the very emblematic Dr. Naledi Pandor. Um, she was regarded as the best performing minister in the last administration. She resigned from cabinet and was replaced by the previous justice minister, Ronald Amola, one of the rising stars in the ANC. In fact, people have tipped him as Ramaphosa's potential replacement after the 2029 elections. But nevertheless, he has a very strong understanding of you know international affairs because he has been privy to the um, contents of the case which have been lodged at the International uh, Criminal Court against um, Israel and other international um, engagement that South Africa has had. So in that regard, there's going to be continuity. You know, there's going to be continuity with respect to, you know, the, um, the, the, the conflict in Palestine. South Africa is always going to stand steadfast with them. They're going to remain neutral with respect to their stance on Russia. South Africa is also going to be champion the voice of Africa on the, in the global south. They're also going to continue to prioritize economic diplomatic engagements with BRICS as well as African Union member states. But also they're going to balance that with, you know, maintaining the good relations that they have with the European Union as well as the United States. Um, south Africa is the biggest beneficiary of the African Growth Opportunity Act, which is the landmark um, trade and investment policy that the United States has towards Africa. So you know, the South, South Africa is going to continue to maintain those and even build on it because, like I said, during the past couple of years, you know, South Africa has really been able to assert itself on the global stage as a voice of not only Africa, but then a voice of global South countries. With respect to economic policy, um, there is still going to be economic continuity. There's going to be continuity with respect to how domestic economic policy is pursued as well as foreign economic policy and the domestic fronts. I noted that fiscal consolidation is going to be the order of the day um, in order to reduce the fiscal deficit. But nevertheless, um, social expenditure, that is, for example, growth, um, um, social welfare programs, grants programs, they will continue to be the order of the day, despite the fact that, you know, the DA has in the past, you know, made disparaging remarks with respect to that. Um, I think that there's going to be a greater push towards industrialization activities. There's also going to be a push towards promoting the digital economy. Um, there's also going to be a push towards, you know, trying to attract investment through the um, facilitation of business visas. The new Department of Home Affairs Minister is on the Democratic Alliance, and the Democratic Alliance has been pushing for um, the introduction of um, uh, digital nomad visas. In this regard, they're trying to attract, you know, foreign currency holders. They're trying to attract investors who are trying to, um, um, you know, move their their activities offshore. So. While there is going to be a significant amount of continuity, there are going to be, you know, other developments which will try to um, differentiate themselves from what the first term of the Ramaphosa uh, uh, um, administration uh, put out. Mm. So, Mr. Leonard, before we let you go, for the first time in 30 years, South Africa now has to deal with different parties, which is now the government of national unity, basically the collision government, instead of one party. Are the people excited about this? Is this what they expected? And how is the general feel of the people about this current government? Are they optimistic or are they looking forward to a one-party system of governments? You know, one uh, defining characteristic of South Africans is that they're very optimistic individuals. Um, there was uncertainty because uh, we've had in the, a municipal level 
you know, coalition governments which haven't worked out um, in Johannesburg, in the capital, Swane, uh, which you all know as Pretoria, in the industrial hub of Ekuleni, in Hauteng, um, Nelson Mandela Bay, another industrial hub in the uh, Eastern Cape. All of these um, cities have seen um, the collapse of their uh, coalition governments at local level. But then, you know, I think that there is a general optimism that things could potentially change um, with respect to how government is pursued. Um, the DA, for all its criticism, has good institutional frameworks in place. Um, and they, they've shown that to a certain extent with respect to um, the Western Cape province where I am based at. Um, now, with respect to President Ramaphosa, he has as much power um, as he has had since he entered office because unlike when he came to the cabinet, he no longer has to worry about um, you know people who are aligned with former President Zuma. The people who are in cabinet are his people and in the presidency has more powers at this point in time. The other parties which have joined the government and national unity have also expressed their desire to put South Africa on the right path. But nevertheless, um, knowing South Africans as well, they're not going to give these governments a blank check. And there are local elections that are supposed to take place in a couple of years. If these parties don't perform, they will punish them at this current election, during the next elections and in the elections going forward. That's why we got to the scenario where we're at where the ANC only had 40% of the national vote. And then when you combine it with the regional vote, they fell below 40%. So it's a matter of wait and see, but there is a general amount of optimism for the moment. Hmm. And of course, we like to be optimistic here in Nigeria. Mr. Lena, thank you so much for joining us this morning to give us that update on the palaces and of course, latest developments in South Africa. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me on there. Of course.